I mean, that's, I, don't, I can't think of another example anywhere in the repertory from this period that is that unusual or so striking. It's an excellent, that's pretty much it. almost like it. You mean the next movement? No, the next sonata. Well, I mean, yeah, right, then once, once yeah, he does it, then other people will copy him. He'll sometimes copy himself, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. But this is totally, yeah. I mean, this is like the, the heartbeat of nature. Kind of yeah. Um, so it's so completely unusual, completely unheard of before, right? So right off the bat, there's a challenge, and then even on the first, you know, page or two, how much of a theme does he really give you? It's just the yeah. Okay. So is that a theme? It's just an idea. It's barely an idea. Yeah. What's another word for a theme? Uh, a smaller uh, theme or uh, an M word? Motive. Yeah. Okay, right. So Beethoven is often very motivically driven, right? Conceptually, his music often is motivically driven or motivically conceived, uh, conceptualized. So it's really more of a motive. It's not really a theme. And what is this when we get here? Just an extension of it. Very good. That's a great word, right? An extension or variation, right? So now in arpeggiated form. So then we have a little bit more of the motive. Where do we actually get a theme? It's really that. That's that's really what should be the second theme. You know, we sort of think it's not a structure. First theme, transition, second theme, concluding material, then we go into development recap, right? Okay, We're, that's really the kind of the first theme in a way, because nothing before it was really resembled a theme. So what this means then is that we have to really think of what is, what's the underpinning behind this and its rhythm, okay? So a couple of things. You're, you're, I mean, you're, you're very steady throw, which is, which is good. Uh, and I wouldn't change your tempo right now if this is comfortable for you. It's a little fast. Okay. Well, what is Allegro con brio? Um, it's fast with um, is brio. It yeah. <laughs> yes. Brilliance. Right? Brilliance. Yes. So, okay. The brilliance doesn't necessarily have to come from the tempo. I wouldn't no. go slower. Mm -hmm. I would not go slower. Okay? okay. If if this tempo, if you feel like this is physically, this is where you are, keep it here. But within that, we got to think about sort of how we're going to create a little bit more brilliance, and that's going to come with the, within the attack and with the with the clarity. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so let, let's start again at the beginning. I'm going to stop and start you. Uh, that's the big picture. Now we're going to kind of get to the nitty gritty. Okay, that's the first four measures. All right. This time you did a better job. You didn't go. Right. This kind of has to just start. You know, it's unfortunate in, in a way because I, mean, I don't need to say that. It's great. It's wonderful. What's unfortunate about it is that you know so many of the sonatas there will be some sort of lead in, like you know if you think of a passionata, so you have a nice nice little phrase that kind of falls to the end, right? Or if you think of some of the sonatas that start with a uh, slower introduction, right? There's something that kind of, yeah yeah a perfect example, right? Perfect example, pathetique, right? Right, so that wonderful kind of heroic arresting opening, also very unusual. 
Beethoven wrote it, and the first first time somebody thought of doing that. Beethoven being the great innovator, that's not a surprise. What you don't have here is anything, it just starts. All right, so you have to kind of know your tempo very clearly in the head. Do you think of a measure or two before you start? I would. Good. Okay, make sure you do that because the first time you gave us a little bit of a bounce and an accent, mm -hmm. and it's not that we don't, we have to hear the note, but it, it's, it's really, it's not accent at all. It just has to begin. So as long as you're thinking of that rhythm and sort of what the motive is before you start, it's almost like it's, music is going and you just step onto the path. Right? Or the, you're walking through the stream, you just kind of wade right through the stream. It's already going, you're just merging with it. Okay? Um, now this. Bum, really young. Bum, really young. Just play this for me by right hand by itself. Okay. If you're doing, are you doing three or two? much better. That's much better. Good. Now do it with the left hand there. Keep this down. Yeah. And here. You can come away from it a little bit more. Just give it a little bit more of a snap. Yeah. That's already. Even that just that little bit gives it a little bit more pain. Right. And that's all it needs. It's another thing that's hard about it is the dynamic level is what? Pianissimo. Pianissimo. Okay, so you got to do all this rhythmic, rhythmical stuff. Now you have some motives and some things moving around that have alternate articulations, and yet you have to do it at a dynamic level that's this loud. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> did you pick this piece? I did, actually. Okay, well, there you go. Serves you right. Yeah, right? you pick a piece like this, you got to do all that hard work. But th this is how you're going to be able to do it. If you keep it down a little bit in the hand and just put it on. And again, come away from this one because this is, to use your word, the extension of that. Right. All right, let's take it from the top. So think of it before you start, be in your tempo. accents to just kind of hit you between the eyes. All right, and that's the first one of many in this piece, so it's really, really great to have that. It's good work. I think you could do a little more, but I'm coming away from that. Um, same thing here. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just gripping a little bit more with the, with the finger this way. The finger is like, yeah. What did you do differently? Gripped it more. Okay, yeah, and I don't mean here. No, it's the please. Piece. Right. Yeah, yes, thank you. Good, exactly right. Right, just using the finger to kind of get a little bit more activity there. Activate it more. Okay, one more time. Okay, think of your rhythm before you start. <laughs> Good, that's the right answer. Right, yeah, right. An indeterminate length. Okay, everyone does bum, 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 bum. One, two, three, four. <laughs> and then right on to the next thing. Okay, if this is in time, this can be held. And if you take the repeat, if you want to play the piece as written, take the repeat. Oftentimes people will go straight through because this is a long piece altogether. Three, all three movements, about 25 minutes or so. Um, so oftentimes people will go through the repeat. If you take the repeat, maybe you don't have to hold the fermata the same way. Right, just something to think about. Okay. Um, can you go from maybe here? Oh, you know, let's do the whole thing again. This is worth doing. Sorry. Okay, yeah, now, do you make 
make a break there or not make a break there? I think a little bit of a break. I think a little bit of slime, but not very much at all. All right. There's an arresting quality to this that is just so, the excitement of the piece is not in, just in the tempo, it's in, because we were talking about the rhythm, but also in the unexpectedness. Bum, 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 bum. We're in C major, we've gone to C minor, basically. We assume C major is going to come back. And it does, but it, with a variation. So if we can just go from, slip from that fermata, right there, the heartbeat kind of a flutter then, kind of comes in. If there's a big break, it's a little obvious. Yeah, 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 it's a little obvious, I think. All right, want to try one more time? No. We're here to practice these things, right? Okay. Oh, the other thing is don't accent this one either. Yeah. The sound is there. Have the sound in your ear. And then you just step onto the path. He just didn't care what was hard. <laughs> he just didn't care. He just wrote it that way because he wanted it that way. It didn't matter what the player would have to do. All right? So here, you have to get from a G to this. All right? Do you ever practice just the Do Do this one. Because this one you missed. Now do, do all four. That was the best one. You know why? Because it was it wasn't abrupt. And it just still wasn't that. Yeah, it was actually a physical thing. You let yourself finish, da -da 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 -da, um, and then you lay. Right. I have to remind myself in my own playing of this all the time, all the time. Finish what you started, and then do the next phrase. Okay. We're in a hurry to get onto the next thing because we're always thinking ahead. And oh, here comes that hard spot, or here I have to move. Here I have to leave. And yeah, you have to know what's coming, but you have to finish what you started. Right, and before you go on. So finish what you started. That way you'll avoid that little, you know, head frenzy one. That kind of thing, which happens all the time in pieces like this. Okay. Um, so in other words, your teacher here wrote lift? Yes. Okay, all right. So I, I, I think what he or she, he or she, 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 she meant by that is just da 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 Finish what you started, then da 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 All right, so do this whole measure and then play the downbeat. <laughs> with the right hand. Oh. That was better. Why was that better? Because I actually got my right hand. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So any place where you have these leaps, uh, Bach and Beethoven, you see this kind of stuff all the time. Okay? Practice those things. You, you, in other words, you finish what you started, and you set up the hand for the next position. Okay? You want to go from here? Now, here you got to think. of piano playing, right? Yeah, right. Good. Okay, so in other words, play the shape. Don't think da 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 four sixteenths. Just play the gesture. Okay? Because you just this is actually a place that's not hard physically, because you just dum yeah, just if your arm is relaxed, your hand just falls naturally to the thumb. Yeah, so use those places that are easy to your advantage. Because there's so many yeah, that's so much better. 
That's so much better. Because right? there's so many other things that, that don't happen that nicely, right? Let's start here. <laughs> pictures of Beethoven, what does he look like? Depressed. He looks like a serial killer. Right? I mean, he's just got this scowl on his face, and he looks miserable, and he looks mean and nasty. No, he's not, he's not a little, he actually, he was a very fun guy to be around for people who knew him. Right? I mean, of course, yeah, he had health problems, he had other things going on so in his life. a chair. Well, okay, so there are stories, everybody has their problems, but it, if it actually, Beethoven was, was a lot more fun to be around as a personality from people who actually knew him than you typically hear. Okay? He was not this miserable, scowling person all the time. Okay? And you see that in his music, and this is a, this is a really boisterous place. Yum, yum. And he's sort of playing with the, the idea of the shapes and the, and the range here. So you can, if you let that come out, much nicer. Also, can you play to the second beat? That inner motive, you want to hear that. There's a radiance to it that I think other keys don't always have, and so sort of, maybe why he decided to modulate up to the third rather than to the dominant here, because it just gives it that brightness. Um, two things that I think this needs. You're playing plenty sweet, okay? What I'm missing, though, is the voicing. It's not that we always have to hear top note, top finger over everything, but I think here we really do, partly because of the register, partly because of the closeness of the chords, Right? We went from a sort of an open, kind of arpeggiated structure, now we're very close in. Okay? There's something more intimate about this style of writing, besides it just being a lyrical theme. You know, there's, there's a closeness to it that I think without um, a better voicing, we lose that a little bit. I hear everything sounds pretty uniform, the theme just doesn't speak enough. Okay? That's the first thing. The other thing, you're often pedaling these two chords together. They can't be. Yes, you should use pedal. You should use pedal. How do we pedal? Well, we got to think about Beethoven's pedal was so different than, than ours on the modern piano, right? Um, 1803, he might have been writing, probably was writing for the English Broadwood piano by this point, I don't, I don't know for certain. That's closer to the modern piano than any of the pianos in Europe at that time, but the pedal was not as heavy, it was not as deep, the piano wasn't as resonant. So we have to be very careful with the pedaling here. Play the chord, then change the pedal. Play, change, play, change. Right, so that you always have that overlap, but it's instantaneously clear. It'll give you the illusion of a legato line. Everything will be pedaled, there'll be nice color to it, but it won't be a blur. Right? It's not, it can't be WC. Try it really slowly. Good, now can you voice the top? Yeah, even a little bit more. Good, now clean the pedal up on this chord. Give me a phrase. Okay, that's better. That's better. Now, Sforzando within what dynamic context? Yeah. Okay. So this this gets to uh, to another thing that's that's often tricky to kind of <coughs> internalize. Uh, is that, it, yes it is sforzando. When he writes sforzando in a piano dynamic though, that doesn't, we have to think about wh what that really means. In other words, it's not like this sforzando. 
how, how do we have to do this one differently? It's more of the peak of the phrase, and you're saying this is where the crescendo perfect. goes to. That's a, that's a perfect definition, exactly. It's the peak of the phrase. It's not a bang, all right? So with this voicing in mind, with this pedaling in mind, can you put these two phrases together? set the triplets, you know, set them properly right away. When they come back later on in like the development and the rest of the sort of closing material, it gets a little harder to kind of understand where it came from. It came from here. And it seems like it's just such, oh, just a simple little scale. I'm just going to throw on this triplet scale. Actually, it's setting the stage for the, for sort of what happens later on in the piece. Okay? All right. So the voicing's a little bit better. I think you can work more with that. Slowly. You practice slowly and really just kind of careful. If you do it for a few minutes a day and go on to something else, I'd be happy with that. Otherwise, you drive yourself crazy, especially with an old piece. Okay, but does that make sense with the voicing? Okay. And the other thing is not just that the top voice has to be louder, but that the inner voices can be thicker, uh, less thick. opposite. Yes, right. You can thin them out a little bit more. So that so that the idea of the chord. So how are all these you know, pitches and tones related to one another? If you go through each one at a super slow speed, you get a chance to hear that a little bit better. Okay? Okay. So going on.